Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 204 for Friday, March 15th. Beware the Ides of March 2019. Happy Pi Day. Oh. You know, Paul, uh, since Pi Day goes on forever, <laughs> does that mean that even though it's 315, since Pi goes on forever, does Pi Day go on forever? See, I'm, I'm, I, it could be argued that it does, right? It never ends. Pi never ends. Pi Day never ends. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by a couple of guys that like math, but are also working musicians. And uh, sponsors for this episode include ExpressVPN. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, uh, yeah, here in uh, Austin, Texas, for South by Southwest, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. Yeah, so here we are. It's a little bit different today. Are. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're a mobile gig gabber. I am a mobile gig gabber. Yeah, yeah, on the scene, man. It's and quite a scene it is. It's um you know, it's uh South by Southwest is is always crazy. It and it's especially crazy. I used to live here in Austin as I'm sure I've mentioned on the show. So there's like I I have to the worst part about South by Southwest is I just have to decide to declare bankruptcy on uh, meeting with all the people that I would love to see, like that live in and around Austin while I'm here, like old friends and old musicians that I used to, you know, it's just like, I just have to take it and kind of roll with the schedule, which is the right way to do a, a conference like South by Southwest. It just kind of sucks when it's like, Oh yeah, you're, you're only like four miles that way. And we're probably not going to see each other because if I, that, I just can't, I, I don't know how to choose, you know, it's like, well, I'll just go with it. So yeah. how long are you in town for? I got into town on Saturday night, uh, this past Saturday, and I'm leaving on Sunday, the the 17th, the um, the Saint Saint Patrick's Day, as it turns out. So yeah, wow. I'm flying to Boston on Saint Patrick's Day. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at your own risk, right? At my own risk, yeah, for sure. Yeah, now, they consider Saint Patrick's Day amateur night in Boston, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. kind of, but it's also, uh, you know, I mean, it's Boston, right? And yeah. and there's a huge, for those of you that don't know, a huge Irish population there. So, um, I, it, like it, it, yes, everybody calls it amateur night because all the amateurs come out, but the pros go out too. You know, it's just that the pros start at five in the morning. I've <laughs> I've played some. Oh yeah, I've played some St. Patrick's Day gigs that start at eight a.m. Like, like downbeat is 8 a.m. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Early morning gigs are such a weird thing. I mean, I don't know. How do you get your voice warmed up? We played one time the San Francisco 49ers uh, do a, a tailgate party um, during their home games. And we played one of those. And we had to get up at about six. And there was all the security and stuff to get us. We had to load in about. Seven and you know I think we played nine to noon or something like that. I just remember it's so weird to play music that early in the day. You are just it's it's there. weird. Yeah, you yeah. just but you're you get just into not it. Tuned to the vibe. No, do you? I I I I've always found that I do eventually. Um, I find it hard to like drink a beer before the set at at eight a.m. Even though I'm <laughs> literally the only person in the club that that seems to have a problem with this. <laughs> That's why they make Bloody Marys, Dave. I guess that is why they make Bloody Marys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I like, so this conversation's going in every direction. I, I don't like hard liquor in general. Um, I've gone through phases with it. There's been times where I, you know, I like, like a good scotch or whatever, but, um, but I've just found it. I, I don't know. It just doesn't agree with my stomach to be honest, but uh, you know, beer is fine. Uh, but even when I uh, didn't, you know, have any issues with hard liquor, I, found that drinking hard, any kind of hard liquor, even if it was baked into, you know, some mixed drink or something, um, it would wreck my throat by like the, the end of the first set it, hmm. and, and not drinking, you know, it's not like having like four shots or something, but just, you know, like a, a drink or two, uh, would, yeah, it would just wreck me. So, uh, if somebody brought like tequila to the stage or whatever, I would always just toss it over my shoulder. Um, Ooh. I had to learn. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you don't want to like sacrifice the performance. So, yeah. So, so you sacrifice the tequila. I did. Yeah. If it was a gig where I had to sing, you know, if it's a, if it's a band where I'm, I'm not one of the primary singers or whatever, then, then it doesn't matter as much, but 
Yeah. 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 Mm. But yeah, those, those early morning gigs, um, they're always fun, but interesting. I, there was one that you mentioned a tailgate as an early morning gig. There was one where I played a tailgate as an early morning gig at uh, a university of New Hampshire homecoming football game. And then raced to the airport, got on a plane and played a late night gig with you on the other coast. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> That's hard. That's a professional right there. I felt like Phil Collins at Live Aid that day, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a story to tell. And I have a story to tell where I can say I felt like Phil Collins at Live Aid, but I had to ride and coach. I didn't ride the Concord. So, you know, a <laughs> little, little, little different, just, just a smidge, but, you know. It was fine. Accentuate the positive, man. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when that's I tell the story in public, Paul, and, and certainly when I tell <laughs> it on the podcast, I won't mention the flying and coach part. So yeah, don't go. do that. Right. All right. Cool. <laughs> so you're in Austin. Yeah. I, is, does, does Austin have a nickname? Austin's not Music City. That's Nashville, right? Austin is the live music capital of the world. Got it. Yeah. And yeah. this year, uh, this week in March, South by attracts like 30. 30, 40,000 people to town, right? Yeah. Yeah. Music I people, think that's right. tech people, and, uh, and film people, all sorts of different people come for this conference. You spend most of your time in the music part of the world there or in the tech part of the world there? Yes. Or, or both. I, yeah. Both I, 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 I do both. Uh, you know, we, we started covering South by Southwest for Mac Observer in the interactive part of it basically when that started. Um, and for the most part, we've always had some sort of a presence here. And, and, and that's a, that's an interesting part. It, it, you know, it, it's hard to sort of isolate any one part of South by Southwest from the other, although you certainly can, but really when you look at it as a whole, even the interactive part takes on the flavor that's sort of infused by the fact that there's a film festival going on and then that there's a music festival that's about to start. And we're going to have some events even during the tech thing to give you that flavor. And it, you know, it's a tech conference where like the percentage of women is way higher. Like it, it certainly, I, I didn't do any, any official polling or anything, but it felt like there were more women at this tech conference than men. Uh, I'm probably wrong about that, but I've, I've certainly, I've never even been to a tech conference where I feel like that's even, you know, it's not 50, 50. So um, well, South by has all these really interesting dynamics. It really, that's it became yeah. a, a really a tastemakers conference, right? It's really, it is really an observation of, of music, uh, excuse me, of culture uh, that has kind of gotten a hold of the under 40 set. And, you know, Twitter was kind of announced and rolled out there. And, you know, the tech startups said, oh, hey, maybe if I can get elbow to elbow with some music superstars, you know, that would be a good launch activity. And so the serendipity of, of uh, you know, the, the startup culture coming out of San Francisco, coming out of Silicon Valley around the world, really, and the music culture kind of combined to have created this interesting stew. And I guess this year there's like a really big political, like all, all the democratic candidates have been flying in. Are you feeling that as well? I had totally. So I, I skipped uh, three or four years of South by Southwest and then resumed coming last year. And, and first of all, everything that you said about this conference and it being truly a melting pot is totally right. It, it feels like a conference where everybody that's here is either creating something, wants to create something, wants to support someone creating something like creation is and, and, and inspiration is really palpable here. Um, it's a, a little bit like attending an Apple keynote. You know, there's that reality distortion field where you're like, wait, 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 no, just cause I have some original songs doesn't mean I'm, I'm, but you know, I could easily that, that the path to, to fame and fortune is easy, but you start to believe that while you're here, like, Oh, everybody's talking about the right ways to do things. But I had skipped South by Southwest during the last sort of, you know, big political thing. Like last year when I came, Elon Musk spoke and Eddie Q from Apple spoke. And certainly I went and saw the Instagram founder speak uh, earlier uh, this week, which was interesting because, you know, they just uh, told Mark Zuckerberg to, you know, take this job and shove it. Right. But um, so that was interesting. But I'd, I, I had forgotten that this would be filled with politics. And certainly that 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 was true in the early part of the week for the quote unquote interactive, you know, keynotes and those sorts of things. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely palpable, sort of. I mean, it's it is an outlier, though. It's it, it's not part of the South by Southwest, like core curriculum, if you would. So, it, I mean, it, it is this year, but it's not generally Right. And it's not always so. So it is seen as like these little like blips, like having Elon Musk here did not feel out of character um, having, you know, Elizabeth Warren here. 
the, the, the way the conversation sort of goes around it, it's like, oh, yeah, there's that thing that's sort of part of it, but separate. So, but yeah, it's well, here. It's, it's a lens on emerging culture. And right now, that's politics it. is part of emerging culture. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so back to our core mission here, should we choose to still stay on and tell me about the music you're seeing this week? Yeah. So it, it's been, it's been fascinating. It, you know, it, I, it, serendipity is always the is the right word to describe South by Southwest. And, and I plan my schedule such that I allow for that because you never know who's going to be where, what's going to happen or anything like that. I did start the music part of my week by going to see Red Volcare, uh, who is uh, a fantastic. Legend. OK, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, he is a legend and and he's an Austin guy. He was Merle Haggard's right hand man and. um uh, you know, which uh, in and of itself is a, a great pedigree, but uh, he can, I mean, this guy can play, you, play, you know, yeah. he's just, he, I have it, the way he's able to move his fingers, he's got these fat sausage fingers, red, <laughs> I, I say this with love. Um, and he's in his seventies easily, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. But, but he's like that. He's a local Austin fixture. I mean, he's he's one of the poster musicians for for what it means to be an Austin musician. Right. It's totally true. He and he's just um, it, he, he is. He's so he's such a pro the way he plays, even on a bad night. Uh, you'd never know he was having a bad night. Right. I mean, he's he's that other level up that that so few people uh, can attain. And he's, he, he speaks through his guitar with personality. I mean, he's also got a great yeah. voice, but, um, but, uh, this time I get to the Saxon pub about which a movie actually has been made. I don't know that I'm going to be able to see it, but, um, but, uh, hopefully uh, it just didn't show at times where I could, where I could make it. But um, so I go to the Saxon pub, which is sort of a, an Austin legend. It's, it's outside of downtown, but not that far of outside. And uh, it's a club I've played. It's, you know, it's not a huge place, but it it's just been here forever and everybody plays. And red always plays the Saxon on the opening night of South by Southwest music, or at least he has. So I made my plans and I went down and I watched um, red and on stage as red is getting on stage. I realize. Oh my goodness! There's Bill Kershen on stage mm -hmm. alongside him. Bill was um, in Commander Cody, right? And but he's also recorded with like Elvis Costello and Nick Lowe. And, I mean, he's he too is a legend. And here are these both mm -hmm. both of them legends with Telecasters, right? How big a place? Oh, I, you know, I don't know how big the Saxon is, but the area where the where you would sit like in the bar to watch music is uh, maybe it holds 100 people. Uh, mm. You know, it's just not it's not huge. No. Right. And and it wasn't full either. That's the thing is like <laughs> because it's not part. It's not right in downtown. You sort of have to take like an Uber, or, you know, so find some other way to get there. But um, but so there's these two guys, you know, masters at their craft, clearly very good friends having a blast with each other and just having this conversation, you know, musically and, and verbally and uh, it just fantastic. Uh, I mean, and the way both of these guys played, Holy crap. Mm. <laughs> Seeing them both together. It was almost a shame that they were both there. Cause it was only a 40 minute set. That's generally what people get at, at South by Southwest. So to be like, Oh, well this is, I like, I'm really lucky to get to see this for 40 minutes, but since they're both here, could they have 80, you know, like, can we, can we add it together and, and get, get more of this? But yeah, that was pretty cool. Pretty cool. So that's how I started my week. Um, I, then I stuck around for a band after, uh, after red at the Saxon and it was a band from LA called Balto. And I, you would have liked this, Paul, the singer was wearing a Springsteen for president t-shirt. So, <laughs> yes. yep, yep. There you go. And, uh, and, and, you know, and then I started bouncing around Edie Brickell and new Bohemians played. I'd never seen her before. Um, she was fine. Her voice is much better suited to being, produced in the studio than mm. than projecting live um and they were kind of a boring band to be perfectly honest but you know whatever i mean i'm not complaining so the way it works at south by is you buy a wristband and all the official south by venues you get in line or you buy a wristband that puts you to the front of the line and that's basically how you get access and there's there's 
a published schedule of the performances or you just bar hop and whoever's there is there? No. Uh, so, yes, you can get a badge or a wristband and uh, to, to get you into the venues and, and the conference as well. Uh, and then, yes, there's absolutely a published schedule. There are some things that don't make it on the schedule, like the fact that Bill was playing with with Red. I, I don't think it was intentionally made a kept a secret. I, I just think it was Red slot. And, you know, he didn't really think much of it. Like, somebody. Yeah, yeah he invited. Right. Well, it turned out he invited Bill and Bill's band. So it was Red Volker playing with Bill Kirshen and his band is, is how right. that how that worked out. But, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's fine. Um, but then, yeah, then there's a, there's a schedule and amazingly they stick to it. Like even the, like I said, everybody's got a 40 minute slot and it's 40 on 20 off 40 on 20 off. So generally everybody starts at the top of the hour and it's amazing how many midnight shows I've seen this week that, that start at midnight. Like right it, it just, the nose. Yeah. it's crazy. It like it, it, this would never happen anywhere else. And it's, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it's really well done. And what was the hot? So, you know, the, one of the big appeals is to see pretty well-known talent at a club level, right? Kind of. Yeah, that has become less so in the last couple of years. Um, I mean, it still exists, but but there's there's less and less of it. Uh, you know, I mean, there was one year where I bounced around and I saw, you know, the New York Dolls in one club and and then like, you know, Bowling for Soup in another club and the Presidents of the United States in another club and. Uh, and Big Star, right? And the DBs and Robin Hitchcock, right? I mean, like all of this in one year is, you know, crazy. Maybe that was, maybe I've com combined two years. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but like it, you could just bounce from, if you, if you planned your day, you could bounce from club to club and, and see all these bands, right? And the bands that you had heard of. But most of the time, you know, you would get there before or stick around after and hear about some, hear some band that you hadn't heard of. And those were equally as good, sometimes even better. Right. So, um, so there was this, this sort of forced serendipity in the schedule. There's less of that this year, but I don't want to say there's none of it. I mean, for example, last night I went and saw Amanda Palmer. Uh, she was playing. There's two venues, at least two, but two that I go to pretty regularly that are in big churches downtown. And she was playing in one of them and it was just her and a piano and it was fantastic. You know, one of the best parts about Austin is that, or at South by Southwest in particular, but Austin in general, is that people here, by and large, are you know professional music fans. They they know how to go and listen to music, and um, there, you know, this church is kind of a weird thing. There's no bar there. Everybody sits in pews. I mean, it's church, you know, and and then there's you know Amanda Palmer and a piano up on the stage, and. There was one tune that she played and she really milked the ending. Like, you know, she she hit the the five chord and then probably waited, you know, three seconds before she hit the one chord to, to put the button on the tune. And everybody stayed silent in that moment. And it was like, oh, yeah, you wouldn't get this. any like somebody would be hooting and hollering by then, you know, <laughs> so, but but not here. It was like you could have heard a pin drop and there were probably, you know, 300 people in this church. So so that was cool. You know, cool little little moments like that. Uh, Sounds cool. Yeah. Um, there's one thing, though, that I that I've seen this week. There, there's a film festival in addition to the music festival. And um Sometimes they 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 merge in in very serendipitous ways. And so I want to talk about at least one of those. But first, I want to talk about our sponsor, which is ExpressVPN at ExpressVPN.com slash gig gab. Now, you know, I'm traveling this week, week, right? And so I'm on all kinds of public Wi-Fi. I don't know who's managing the Wi-Fi in these clubs, uh, even in the hotel. Like, I don't know if other if they've secured it the right way so that other guests can sniff my traffic and all of that. And, you know, it, like bad things can happen. We know that these bad things can happen. We all tend to think, yeah, but cybercrime is something that happens to that guy, not this guy, you know, mm. and you might think that nobody wants your data or that hackers can't grab your passwords or credit card details, but you know, you might be wrong. And that is sort of a dangerous uh, set of dice to roll, right? Stealing data from unsuspecting people on public Wi-Fi is the way these things happen. And when you leave your internet connection unencrypted, 
you know, it's kind of like writing your passwords and all your other information on like a big billboard, right? That's why I'm using ExpressVPN all week. And the cool part is it is so fast and so smooth that I forget that I'm running it, right? It like, it just works. And while it's working, it secures and anonymizes your browsing and encrypts your data. The apps are super easy to use on your phone or your computer or your tablet. Just one click and you're good to go. And you can safely surf on public Wi-Fi without being snooped or having any of your data stolen. And it's just less than seven bucks a month that you can pay to get the same Express VPN protection. Peace of mind and safety. That's it. Right. Yeah, exactly. So to do this and get a special deal, um, visit expressvpn.com slash gig to get three months free with a one year package. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S V-P-N dot com slash gig gab, G-I-G-G-A-B. For three months free with a one-year package. One last time with feeling expressvpn.com slash gig gabs. Are th- a gig gab, not gig gabs. What, how, why did I say gig gabs? When have I ever said gig gabs? Expressvpn.com slash gig gab. Easy for me to say. I was out late last night. Uh, and our thanks to ExpressVPN, of course, for sponsoring this episode. All right. So I, I want to tell the Mr. Jimmy story. Um, oh. I had no idea who Mr. Jimmy was. Do you, off the top of your head, do you know who Mr. Jimmy is? Paul, Uh, if it's not Hendrix, then I don't know. It's not. Mr. Jimmy is a Japanese gentleman that became obsessed with Jimmy Page. And -hmm. when I say obsessed, I, 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 we shouldn't use obsessed to describe anything else because we're not hitting the mark. Um, He obviously fell in love with Led Zeppelin's music, fell in love with the way Jimmy Page played, learned to play guitar, learned all of Jimmy Page's, uh, you know, mannerisms and, 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 and his riffs and everything that he could possibly learn about Jimmy Page and became sort of a real Led Zeppelin historian it is really what, you know, what he has become. And they made this movie about him and he uh, played in Japan for a long time, toiling away, but obsessing. Um, he was, he, I think he sold, sold kimonos during the day, believe it or not. And then by night he would become Mr. Jimmy and he uh, he would get the costumes right, like down to the 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 way the stitching is done. Uh, You know, the obsession just goes deeper and deeper. He really he embodies Jimmy Page when he plays and he kind of looks like him, too. It's, It's sort of interesting, but it's it's, you know, his problem and the movie sort of goes into this is that. In order for him to truly do this, he needs to surround himself with three like-minded people. And by definition, there are not three like-minded people that happen to play drums, keys and bass and vocals and can cover, you know, the respective parts of Led Zeppelin. So uh, he then th- this movie was was actually really, really well done. There's a documentary about him and I, I think it'll be coming out. I think it'll get picked up. Uh, but, you know, they followed him around. He uh, he did this in Japan for 20 years. Then he came to the States after Jimmy Page came and saw him in Japan. He was inspired by that and thought, no, this should be my career. Like I can, I can do this. If Jimmy Page came and saw me, I can do this. So he moved to LA and he joined a band called Led Zepp again. And he played with them. I think he did about a hundred dates in, in two years, but he doesn't like Led Zepp again is, as you might guess, a Led Zeppelin tribute band. Mr. Jimmy doesn't want to be in a tribute band. He wants to be in a revival band. And, and, and the difference is when Mr. Jimmy takes the stage, he wants to play like the 1973 North American tour version of Led Zeppelin, but he doesn't want it to be note for note. (laughs) He just wants everybody on stage to also have the same, you know, depth of knowledge on what that means, like, because, you know, the British tour of 1973 is very different from the U.S. tour. And he'll play you the way, you know, they played like, I, I don't know, a whole lot of love or something. And it's like, oh, no, look, it's it's a little slower here and this and they and they, the groove is slightly different, you know, and because he studied all the bootlegs and everything. But he wants to walk on stage with three other people that have exactly that same amount of knowledge so that they are then free to improvise and and sort of be what Led Zeppelin might have been uh, within the confines of, you know, 1973 U.S. tour, but certainly not 1973 British tour. Obviously not. Right. Not tonight. We'll do that tomorrow night. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. So he lasted two years in uh, in Led Zepp again. As you might imagine, those guys just wanted to go out and play the hits because that. You know what? Let, let me pause you there. Yeah. So it's an Here's interesting my... thing. Yeah. Well, I, I would hasten to bet that most, many, most, many tribute bands start with some version of that. Some guy who's a fanatic about something and wants to feel that feeling, express that music is that guy. I think I told you this when I was starting the house rockers, I wanted to get some advice about, you know, how to be successful, you know, how to find gigs. And I talked to a guy who was the manager of uh, one of the first really hugely successful tribute bands here in the San Francisco Bay area called super diamond, a a Neil diamond tribute act, which now tours nationally. It's a, it's it's a living for that music, those musicians. And he said, you know, the the difference is there's different levels of what people think commitment is. Art. That was the advice he gave me. That is, uh, that's exactly what we're talking about here. That's right. Yeah, yep. You know, and you know, this scales in, in a thousand different ways. Some is how much you practice. Some is just how much you sweat the details, you know, and with tribute bands, that's a particularly, that, that concept of what commitment is scales to any problem in, in life. But I mean, certainly when it comes to bands and music, but when it comes to tribute bands specifically, you know, what is a tribute band? Is it a, is it a tongue in cheek? We'll play the songs that we can all sing along and nobody's paying attention. Or is a tribute, a, a exact visual and, and sonic representation. Some bands take it all the way out to there. Most don't, but I get it. And I would bet most tribute acts start with some amount of fanaticism, some amount of passion that, uh, that the founder of the band may not end up being the leader of the band or even the lead singer of the band. Sure. But I would bet that that's a big reason why the whole tribute genre kind of came to be what it was is because, you know, there were people who were like, Oh, hey, there are all these classic rock bands that did this amazing thing that sounded really, really unique. Let's sweat the details and get the other people who sweat the, you know, the, yeah. the assumption that the fan base is also that uh, nuanced in their listening. Well, that's, that's the issue, right? And that's the issue that, that Mr. Jimmy has been having is the fans. Like, I don't, even know how many true diehard Led Zeppelin fans need to go see someone other than Led Zeppelin play a 30 minute version of Dazed and Confused. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I'll say that again. Like we know who my favorite guy is. Yep. I I could only imagine I'll be be pleasantly surprised or nonplussed by a tribute band to Springsteen, right? Right. I mean if they if they overdo it and take it way too seriously they're not going to come close enough. It's it's not, you know, to me, it's, it's gonna, not, not going to be that, the same thing. It's not Bruce. Right? It, it won't but ever it, be Bruce unless it's Bruce. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you can still see Bruce, you know, you can see yeah. him on YouTube all the time. You can, you know, yeah. you'll see him live, you know, whatever it is. So I, I, I've always wondered what the arc of uh, sustainability of, of tribute acts are. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and that's right. That's it. Right. If you want to, if you, Mr. Jimmy is not doing the tribute act for anyone, but him. And right. and he he just assumes that there will be, you know, throngs of like minded Led Zeppelin obsessed freaks that that do like to hear the 30 minute version of Dazed and Confused where the band leaves the stage and he brings the bow out and all that. Like you can hit all those sort of things where somebody can say, hey, oh, yeah, I saw the Zeppelin tribute band. The guy used the bow. That was cool. You can do that in about nine minutes. Right. You don't need <laughs> to go 30 and right. and um, and so that's why he he left that band um, and then he got picked up by Jason Bonham, believe it or not. And he has become Jason Bonham's guitar player. Uh, and I guess because because I don't guess I don't have to guess because Jason Bonham is John Bonham's son. Uh, I think Mr. Jimmy sort of is willing to change the bar for those gigs. Cause there was, they showed him backstage as they were going to the stage one night and, you know, Mr. Jimmy says, Oh, we should play the, you know, 1971 version of, of, uh, of whole lot of love tonight or whatever. And then Jason turns to the band. He's like laughing, you know, in this big gregarious sort of, you know, English way laughing. Oh, did you hear that boys? We're going to do the 1971 version tonight. Like, like, okay, Mr. Jimmy, we're just going to go ahead and play the song the way we've rehearsed it. And that's going to be okay. You know, uh, um, it, but he does that, but I did get to see him play. Um, he played actually right after the movie ended, which is a fairly common thing for when there's a premiere. Actually, I didn't even see the premiere that happened earlier in the week, but he and his, his singer came out and, and played a couple of songs acoustic, which was fine. Um, yeah, sound in a movie theater is always a little weird, but, um, but then they played a full two hour gig 
on which is rare for South by Southwest. It was a midnight set on I think Wednesday night and uh and they played as Mr. Jimmy, not not with Jason Bonham, but this was, you know, Mr. Jimmy's vision of what this band should be. And it was interesting, but I would never go see it a second time. It was because, just too tedious. And uh, and you know, and they were taking like they would and I'm sure Led Zeppelin did this, but you know, they were taking fragments of songs and sort of peppering them in here. And they remember Led Zeppelin was like really drunk on stage most of the time in the early days. And mm-hmm. this particular gig that I went and saw, we were told was uh late 1971 Led Zeppelin. So, mm-hmm. so he was wearing the checkered uh, sweater vest thing that, that Jimmy Page wore on the back of the third album and like really like went deep on all this. And he, Oh, and he was wearing uh, what I have to assume is a fake beard because I'd seen him in person the day before and he had no facial hair whatsoever, but it was a really good stage beard. Uh, you know, and so it was just this really awkward thing, especially after having seen the movie, knowing that, that like in this guy's head, he believes that this is what's going to really, truly be entertaining. And it was only like, there was part of that was part of why it was entertaining or interesting to watch. Cause it was like watching this dynamic of here's these people watching and let's see how their interest sort of wanes throughout the night. Whereas this guy is still delivering as though this is the best thing that could ever possibly be on a stage with, with barring say Led Zeppelin coming back uh, and playing, which, you know, I, I don't think they will, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> uh, it, you know, so, so it was just this, it, and it was really awkward seeing his interactions with the band because the band knows this isn't what people want to see. And like, even the singer, <laughs> yeah, the, even the singer said, and you know, I mean, they were all very jovial and, and such with each other, but the singer said, uh, and now, you know, we'll, we'll be recreating that, you know, the 30 minute version of, of, uh, dazed and confused and everybody sort of cheers. And he says, I'm not kidding. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like just, just to sort of let you in on, uh, I need to set your expectations here because this is going to take up a long chunk of the show. That's, and that's sad though. I mean, it you is. Know, it, it, here's what I'm hearing. Here, I'm hearing that, uh, here's this one guy who is manically obsessed and committed. Yeah. And he did his best to put together as good a band that could come up to his bar, but, but clearly they really weren't as committed. No. And it was parody to some, and that's, that just sounds sad to me. That sounds, I mean, a, you know, good for the guy, Mr. Jimmy, that he is that all in. Right. I mean, I don't know that it's good for him. I would actually disagree with that. I think it's, I, I, it, this may work, and yeah, and I he doesn't have a choice, Dave. I mean, it's it's really what is driving his every action. And you go to those, you go to those lengths. You are all in as a fan, and that's what I'm saying. I think that's the start of many tribute bands. Is someone's all in, and I. But I would also say it, it probably leads to a lot of disappointment. Trying to, I know for me, it's really been hard. I've wanted to do that with a Springsteen tribute, and I've gotten some good guys. I've gotten guys who like me and are all in for me. Yes, but but, but what I would rather have. Well, not rather. I appreciate the good guys that have given me great of performances. Course. But, um, man, in my mind, it's like, oh, what magic it would be if I could find, you know, a piano player who is that into it as me. A, you know, a, a, a you know, I guess drummer and sax I, I kind of had nailed. But the other guys were kind of like, you know, it's a cool project. You know, clearly you're into it. It'll be fun. We'll, we'll entertain some people. And they're into it to that level and played well. But, the, you know, to try and find a band that's and then it's just an exercise in in futility. I mean, it'd be, it's just really hard to find that. I, I, yeah, I guess I, I don't I, I certainly today I, I don't uh, that does not resonate with me right now, whether it would have at 17 years old or not. I, I can't really say, you know, the bands that I was into back then, you know, all the prog bands, Rush and Yes and ELP, it was very quickly, very evident that I was not going to find people that, that were able to play that music, you know, to the level that these bands that I liked were playing it. I could also still go see those bands. So that, that was sort of different. Um, so I, I backed off on that, but at the same time, I also got involved with people who are writing their own songs. And to me, it seems like if you, if you have that passion about, about music in general, why not let that inspire you to write your own material as opposed to trying to hit this bar that, that, you know, you can't hit even, and even Mr. Jimmy, like of all the things that sort of he misses, he did acknowledge two things in the movie 
the first was that uh, he cannot, he is not Jimmy Page. And he, and, and he, in fact, he was even asked this in the Q and a after the movie, somebody said, Hey, you know, why are you trying to, why are you so concerned about recreating this particular vibe from 1971? If, if Led Zeppelin played again, do you think they would try that? And his answer was, well, no, they wouldn't, but, but they're Led Zeppelin and he's Jimmy Page. So he's always going to be creating on his own. And it's like, in that's the interview, interesting. Was it clear that this guy's living in some alternate universe or was he firmly understanding that, that what he's presenting to the world is, is, uh, you know, a, not, not a parody, but a, a, uh, a, a, a duplication. Yeah. Well, he said, um, and the other thing that, that sort of showed some self-awareness about this was he said, you know, the culture is different. And I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, the culture is different in Japan than it is in the United States. And he said, I, you know, what I'm doing is a very Japanese way of of tribute. But the American mm. definition of tribute is very different. And again, I'm, I'm massively paraphrasing and sort of, you know, combining various things together. But he is aware that this is not what American audiences want at the very least. Now, whether Japanese audiences would want this or not, I, I think is still a question. But the the sense of of going all the way in. And committing, you know, that level of commitment. And if I'm going to do this, I'm not just going to stop at learning the part. It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural thing. You know, it reminded me, honestly, it reminded me a lot of Steve Jobs, where he, he talked about how his dad told him, you know, you have to paint the other side of the fence, too, even though no one will see it. Mm. You, you know, you, you'll know. And and the same was true with like the clothing that he was putting together. He's like, well, right. But this part, I know it's never going to be seen, but I need to know that it's right. You know, and so there there was definitely that, you know, it's an obsession. Right. But it's a different different level of obsession that we don't generally uh, embrace in our culture. Right. It, it, it we have it in, in bits and pieces. But from what he said, the Japanese culture definitely embraces that because they said, look, we can't compete with America. Or, one of his friends said we can't compete with America or, or, or Great Britain with, you know, their ability to like you know, make a big spectacle of things or, you know, make a big party out of something. But what we can do is we can focus and go all the way and stay committed. And, and so, so yes, he is aware that this is not his thing, but it, it's still, it just felt like, man, you've got what, what a, what a, what a, what an unfortunately limiting scenario this is for him, because if he really, I mean, he's like, look at that drive and that commitment and that passion. If he could focus that into creating his own thing, I, like, I, I feel like many more doors would open for him. And I feel like he might be more, um, he might feel, I, he may feel, feel fulfilled. I, it, that part was hard to say from the movie, to be perfectly honest, because there was just so much struggle uh, you know, with it. And for that reason, it was a really good movie. Cause it kind of made me think like, Oh, there were parts where it was like, this guy's crazy. And mm. well, I guess that was all the way through, but you know, there were parts where it was like, this guy's crazy in a great way. Like what a, what a testament to this thing that committed. It, yeah. But then at the other side is like, wow, but dude, like you, you've missed an, a huge opportunity for yourself here to like, I don't know that he'll ever be happy doing this because he knows mm. he can never attain that which he is striving for. And and there is that self-awareness. Like, I'm not Jimmy Page. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually am surprised. I would think someone now that with that amount of profile, there are there are three other players on this planet that would that are, especially with a band like Led Zeppelin, that would be that committed. That yeah, he but would no, be able to nobody would want to go see it. Um. Yeah. That's the well, problem. I, I went and saw it and it was like, huh, OK, uh, yeah. I mean, I, it was frustrating, actually, because they would play, they would start playing. They played this medley of an encore that was like five songs. The bar was pissed because it ended it like after two when the bar should already have been closed and all this stuff. But so that part was fun. But, they, you know, they they dropped into good times, bad times at one point. It was like, OK, thank goodness. Like here and they were they were playing the heck out of it. Like really, really it was probably the best song of the night. And halfway through, they they go into this like weird jam thing, and it's like, yeah, you know, like you've done a lot of that over the last two hours. Mm. This is the encore. People, you know, brought you back to the stage. I just deliver a couple of hits here, and they played rock and roll in this really weird, like slower groove way that just, I, you know, it's like okay. 
I, I don't know if there's anybody else in the room that that knows that version of rock and roll and prefers it. Like, you know, like, let me put it this way. When you buy the box set from your favorite band. Right. Or that. Aha. Maybe a better way to look at it, because uh, there was that phenomenon a couple of years ago where uh, there was that acoustic version of Aha's take on me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like we all loved that acoustic version. It was like haunting and and really, you know, dark and deep. And and that song is dark and deep and weird. It's about like obsession and stalking and things like that. But, you know, it was it was wrapped. It's it's original version was wrapped in this like happy poppy Pop. little thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was it, it was that dichotomy that, that I think made that song sort of interesting. Plus, the lyrics are just weird because <laughs> of the phrasing and the translation and all that. But, um, you know, we heard that that brooding acoustic version and we were all drawn to it, but we were only drawn to it once you know it it because it it was a different take on something familiar to us right and and the same could be true for clapton's slow acoustic version of layla right if those were the first versions of those songs that had been released we would never have cared about the second version mm. of those songs right so like i get it it's as a as a super fan it's cool to hear the box set and and go deep and all of that stuff but when you're choosing a song that I mean, you're just a cover band, like at the end of the day, you're not playing your songs. You're just a cover band. You know, you've got to think about why are you doing this? If it's just in your basement, cool, then let's play that weird arrangement and see if we like it. But if you're going to if the goal is to fill a room full of people, unless you can fill a room full of people that also loves the fact that what you're playing is different from the better of the two versions uh, then you probably should play just the better of the two versions. And sure. You know I, I can't I mean? disagree with you. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's a Zeppelin fan fest that happens somewhere right. once a year. That, once a you know, year. That, that, yes. Right. <laughs> right. No, totally. Like that's the kind of thing that where that would make a lot of sense. Like, okay, now we're all, we are all these like-minded crazy people. And we've, you know, we, we wear our craziness, you know, proudly on our, on our vests, at least in this particular basement. And, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going to love it together. No, there were, I didn't ever went to them, but there were these rush cons, right. Where, you know, a tribute band, I mean, they were, they would have meetings and all this other stuff about the band rush. And then they would have, you know, a tribute band or two play in the evenings. And, and I have heard that those sorts of things would happen. Like, Oh, we're going to do this weird, you know, rush covered uh, bad boy, which was a song. The Beatles also covered, um, you know, in their early, early days, but they never like played it live in, in anything resembling recent years, you know, <laughs> because, mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't, it wasn't them, but, to see a Rush tribute band, if you're all Rush fans, oh, cool. We would never have the opportunity to see Rush play Bad Boy. So now we get to see this tribute band play. Like that kind of thing. Cool. Yep. yep. But I don't think you're going to find that 100 nights a year to go and, you know, like pay your bills. So I don't know. It's just weird. If like to me, the the. And, and this is truly to me, but the reason to play cover songs is to entertain a crowd. If if that's the majority of what you're playing, like when I was in original bands, we would play covers occasionally, you know, we'd have like one cover a set maybe or, you know, one or two covers a night. But and we would actually change them often so that they would be ours. But, you know, the majority of the people in the room were there to hear us play our tunes. So yeah. to hear us play our take on some cover tune was 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 acceptable. You know, it it, it matched what we had worked to set the expectations of for our audience. You know, it's like you're coming to hear us do our thing and here's our take on a thing. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole tribute thing, it, just to wrap this topic yeah. up, you know, it, we talk a lot about ultimately the, the, what works is truth, truth and performance, all those types of things. And this guy, I would hasten to say, maybe he couldn't make a living at it. Right. I think, you know, there's a lot of Led Zeppelin, tribute acts that go around, many of them excellent. You know, the problem is, is that he's the only one on stage that is, that is exhibiting this truth. And I, I would, I'd be a little bit more of a purist than you. And I would say if, if he found three other guys to be that committed and there was no BS, you know, we're going to be, an, we're going to be that, that tribute, yeah. like, yeah. you know, that there would be, there's enough Led Zeppelin fans. You know, I don't think you can go into a cover club and convert people. You have to go find the people who would kind of be predisposed to what you're doing. Totally. But, you know, he, it sounds like he's living between the two worlds, you know, living between, 
you know, the, 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 the casual entertainment of people who like Led Zeppelin plenty and, you know, wanting to get to that point where, the, no, this is the most authentic Led Zeppelin experience that you can have. There's, you and know, that's, that's true. Like that, it, as far as it goes, and again, unless Led Zeppelin were to get back together, um, this is the most authentic, you know, you're going to get it, it within the confines of, of what's available. But but he has yeah he has sort of backed off on it at least when he takes the stage with you know the Jason Bonham experience because he's hired to do a thing there and he's not driving the bus right you know Jason Bonham is is driving that bus and no this is how we're going to do these arrangements and you know I'll take your input because you obviously are a historian and that's cool but but <laughs> this is how we're going to play it tonight because but song lengths aside right so the the biggest thing is that you know you can get lost in these kind of drawn out jam things that uh, you know don't translate as well I mean. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, there are a couple of like national touring Pink Floyd. Yeah. Tributes, right. Light show and everything. I mean, you know, you know, flying pigs and everything. Right. Right. So, I mean, and there's an audience for that. So besides long extended, like you keep going back to 30 minutes of days and confused that aside, how was the show? The show was good. I eat, Did but- you believe the show? Um, I didn't believe I was seeing Led Zeppelin. Did you believe that 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 this was about as close as you could get? Mm, no. Well, that's it right there, right? Yeah, no. Why why is it? Because it was too affected, right? Like it it uh, was it was took themselves too seriously. Yeah, yeah, in in that sense it I mean it was like watching a theater show, right? You know, like mm. not only am I going to play these parts, but I'm going to wear the costume and I'm going to make the same moves and the same facial expressions and the same affectations and all of that. And it's just like, well, we all know that Jimmy, we either know or don't know, but I know that Jimmy Page did this. I've watched the song remains the same, you know, (laughs) Uh, well, that's, you know, that was it. And, and I didn't need to like, if Jimmy Page were here, he wouldn't be doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, this is not the theater show I came, I, I would want to go see. I mean, I went, I did go to, I did want to go see it because I, I wanted to, I wanted to see it. I wanted to know what that was like, but, but it was more like, uh, you know, uh, oh, you, there's an eight foot tall person in that room. I want to go see that, you know, like that's, 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 that's not something you see every day, but in terms of like, oh, there's an eight foot tall person. Like once you see that, it's like, well, that's, they're just a human. Like it's not entertaining. It's got to suck on airplanes, you know, like that kind of thing. And and then you're like, yeah, it just gets a little sad because mm. everybody in the room knows too affected. That it's too affected. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right way to say it. Yeah. So the truth doesn't come through. No, no. I mean, it does in that, like, that's what this guy wants to do. Um, that much comes through, but uh, it's like, okay. Yeah. I don't know. Just, yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> Good story though. A little weird. Yeah. Yeah, and Good it, lesson. it is. There are many lessons in there, right? Like, y- you know, um, yeah, don't take yourself too seriously, especially if you're out. I mean, don't take yourself too seriously at all. Take the music seriously. But um, and I think I think there's you know, that's that's where that um, that's where that goes. Super Diamond walks that line really interesting. They don't disrespect the music. They sure. definitely wear the costumes. They definitely go for the sound tone, you know, notation. Um but you feel like you're you're together celebrating it in a joyous way, not a way that demands you to be to get the it, not it, it not. I don't want to say that, that it feels like it's an inside joke because it's not it's not parody. Um, right. Right. The music is held held up respectfully. They sing it great. They you know, they play it seriously. They don't poke fun at themselves or at Neil. Um, and it's a very healthy uplifting experience to, to go to that show i guess you know when you get into some genres of music it's hard to re- to replicate that right you know uh yeah no, just that, hard. That, yeah what you're talking about what you're describing is a celebration right like we we all want to come together and celebrate this neil diamond music but we don't necessarily i'm guessing we don't necessarily need to recreate that night where neil had a little too much to drink and told this right. weird story yeah. you know that happened once and you know maybe doesn't choose need carefully, to be carefully re- i guess choose no, choose wisely yes yeah. well one is to be entertaining to all of us perhaps the band included but but there is this sense of we're going to entertain everybody and we're going to be aware of and of of who all is here whereas what i saw was you know, I'm going to assume that you want the same thing I do. Um, and knowing full well that 
that you probably don't, <laughs> especially with the I way want, the band I would, was. I, yeah. I, I would bet they don't assume anything. They just like, I'm going to put myself out there. You mm-hmm. know, I, I, I would, I would, I, I got to get this out of me. I, I'm going to guess this guy is so, I mean, his hair, he did his hair the same way. I know it's so, crazy. Yeah. 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 So anyway, cool story though, dude. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cool story, bro. I, I, that's what I'm getting out of this. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. And more to come. I, um, I saw another nice uh, com- combination of uh, something that happened, a movie that happened about the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville. So we'll talk about that on a future episode. And I and was there. You, you oh now I really want to talk about this. Okay, so great great uh, segue into next week's episode or whenever the next episode is. I don't know if we're doing one next week or if we're resuming the following week, but whenever that is, I've got some other companies that actually might be really helpful to you uh, as listeners that I met here at South by Southwest. So we'll talk about them as well in an upcoming episode. But for now, I think that's all we got, right, man. It's a good one. I, I I didn't realize we would get this much mileage out of your South by Southwest trip report. Sometimes, you know, so it, it, it depends on uh, depends on how much it makes me think, I guess, man. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's sure. how it goes. Yeah. Folks, thanks so much for listening. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I did have one comment we were going to share today, but, you know, here we are. I took up all the air. So we'll leave some room for you folks next time. Tip of the hat to Mr. Jimmy. Always be performing. That's right. Yeah. <laughs>